cheaper than our producer's underage sister, edgier than the stuff shown on late night television. Newer than Kim Kardashian's ex, live from Orlando, it's Crazy Train Radio. Obviously behind the controls there and on the phone board and everything else, and also at our known exclusive news desk, is the cult classic, Jake Steele. Jake, what's going on? Nothing much. What about you? Good, good. Yeah, but we know you try to, you know, work hard at busting tables and stuff, and we're trying to move you up in the world here, but... Yeah, busting tables over at Denny's. Yeah, well, hopefully we, uh... So how much do you actually know about hockey before we get into this? Do you know a lot? I've lived my life around hockey. I don't know what you're talking about. Your life's around hockey? Of course, man. My grandfather was Gordy Howe, Mr. Hockey. Yeah, that's a bunch of bullshit. We know that for sure. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just saying because of the area you grew up in, upper New York and near Canada, since we're trying to move uh, the cult classic here up from busting tables at Denny's there, why don't we throw it over to the news desk? Today we're going to be speaking with John Bork from CSN Philly about the NHL. Alrighty then. First thing we're going to be talking to him about would be the league-wide realignment and what it means for the 2013-2014 NHL season. <laughs> and after that, we're going to talk about players approving the new hybrid icing rule. Are you following me, camera guy? Which will be followed by the season opens with contract extension in Toronto. That's crazy! After that, we'll be talking about Toronto GM landing in hospital. Oh, no! Along with fighting and hockey. What are you guys doing? Putting on the foil. We're talking about a serious note with Thomas Bocoon expected to miss three to six months with a uh, blood clot. Oh, no! Along with new debuts, both players and coaches in NHL. All right, after we're done with those segments right there, what else are we getting into? We'll dig into what's going on in the minors, both the AHL and ECHL. For those who don't know, the AHL stands for the American Hockey League and my hometown team, the Rochester Americans. Oh my God, who the hell cares? Just throwing that out there for you people. And the ECHL stands for the East Coast Hockey League. Uh, segment three, I think, it, well segment I should say three and four are going to be interesting for me. Because three is actually, we're actually going to do that in two different segments, with Jackie at least. But what is that? Well, before I was rudely interrupted, yes. We'll be spending a couple segments with Jackie Clark, the author of Flyer Lives. We'll be talking hockey history and play some trivia with some of our callers for autographed copies of... cool part about, she gave us three different copies of the book to give away uh, to the listeners, but... Not only did she offer him, but she actually signed it along with her father, who was mentioned in the book and has a nice little portion of the book, Hockey Hall of Famer Bob Clark. Of course, a living legend. Yes. And let me guess, he's going to be your grandfather. Uh, he's more of like a step-uncle, twice removed. Okay. And this is going to be interesting. And what is that? Well, our last piece, folks, is going to be hockey trades. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to hear everybody's opinions. 
on whether they think so-and-so is going to a good team, so-and-so is going to be a bad trade. I want to hear everybody. I want to hear your thoughts, people. Well, we're going to we're going to be discussing mostly the stuff that's been happened in the past. But you know, Jake's got a good, interesting uh, point there. Maybe we'll take some opinions through to Facebook or whatever about. You know, I definitely think we could take opinions of things that could happen this year as far as the trades and whatnot. Maybe expand that to coaches and different other things that usually go on throughout the season. Thank you for the news desk. But what we're, I'm thinking we'll do is, Jackie mentioned, uh, we're going to, she's going to give, we're going to give away three copies of the book. I think we'll do two trivia questions, then we'll do one for Stump the Crop, because I am the end all be all of sports knowledge. So why don't we take a quick break, and we will jump right into it. Hello out there, we're on the air, it's hockey night tonight. Tension grows, the whistle blows, and the puck goes down the ice. The goalie jumps and the players bump and the fans all go insane. Someone roars, Bobby scores at the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Hey, music fans. If you're in the Philadelphia, South Jersey area on October 16th, swing by Adventureland Store at the Voorhees Town Center in Voorhees, New Jersey to be a part of a very special meet and greet with Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. The event will be from 6 to 8 p.m. along with the signing. The band will also be doing a live acoustic set. Come and get your copy today of the band's new CD, Girl, and have it signed. Details will be available at AdventurelandStore.com. As you go through life, you're faced with a decision. Should I fit in or should I stand out? Blending in tends to be easier and safer, but there's something bold, something honest about standing out when you do it for the right reasons, for things you believe in, things that are important, things like beer. That's why we started brewing Yingling Light Lager. For more than 40 years, big beer corporations have dominated the market with their idea of light beer. Each one is pale and forgettable as the next. We believe it's time for something different, not for the sake of being different, for the sake of being beer. A lower calorie beer with a true lager taste. The result is 99 calories, 100% lager. With a rich amber color unlike any other light beer. It's light beer that makes a statement, and we're happy to make it. Next time you order a light beer, make a statement of your own. Think of it as a declaration of independence. With Yingling Light Lager, rethink your light beer. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Hi, this is Booker T, five-time WCW champion and general manager of Friday Night SmackDown. You listen to Crazy Train Radio. Now, can you dig that, sucker? portion of the show, and we got to welcome back Jackie Clark. How are you doing, Jackie? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, obviously, as you know, it is the beginning of hockey season again, so we definitely got to say, we have hockey action, yo. How was your uh, off season, if we should ask? Well, um, it was a little bit longer than I think we would have liked. Um, you know, it's always tough when um, the team doesn't go as far as um, we hope, but um, it was good, and I think that everyone's just really excited to have hockey back and, um, you know, turn the next page in the, in the chapter and, and get a good new season going. Well, obviously, we have to, and we have you on, we had you on towards the end of last season to talk about your book, Flyer Lives. Uh, 
let's get an update. How have the sales and everything, the response been for that? Well, it's been really, really um, touching, to be honest with you. Um, how many people have um, reached out to me and uh, gotten so many letters and um, warm responses when I've done book signings in some of the bookstores and, and such um, at the carnival, having so many fans come up and tell me how much... Um, they enjoyed the book. Um, it was such a nice trip down memory lane for them. Um, because not only do I talk about what was going on um, in the, um, the players' careers at the time, but talk about what else was going on in Philadelphia and pop culture and other sports. And so it's really um, a, nostal you know, a collection of nostalgia. And everyone, you know, we have the best fans of any, any sport and any team in the world. Um, Philadelphia is just awesome and the response has been um, really great. You know, I was I was a little bit worried when we had the abbreviated season and, you know, um, the team wasn't doing so great, um, but, you know, our fans are so loyal and um, I, I've just been really touched by the, by the response. Well, obviously if we want to, if people want to hear more in depth about the book, uh, they could go back to the previous interview. However, I don't think I asked you this before, and I've been thinking about it the past couple of days since you and me have been talking about you uh, co-hosting for these couple of segments. Curious to know, well, one thing would be, obviously, uh, not to throw some guy under the, night, under the bus, Bob Clark, your father, but what is it about the area here that post-career, a lot of guys, especially you notice hockey, stay in the area, and, you know, obviously... In your case, you know, he had kids, he married. Yeah, he took a job in the front office, but what is it about that most guys, whether they stay and work for the organization or not, they stay here? What is it about this area, you think? Um, well, I can, you know, take it from the horse's mouth, what the guys have told me themselves. Um, really, that um, the way that the city and the people of the Delaware Valley um, embraced them when they first came in 1967 um, you know, they had, it only took them a week to have their first win, and, you know, um, Philly just, you know, the, the, it was a hockey town, even if, um, you know, they didn't know it yet, um, and, um, you know, having the brawn um, and having um, the ability to win, you know, um, they just really lit the city on fire, and, and as, um, as such, the way the people responded to them, like, they just... You know, you have, to, you have to understand, a lot of these guys came from the middle of nowhere. I mean, even for me to this day, um, I don't have any relatives that live in the United States other than my immediate family. Um, so when we say that, we talk about the Flyers family, um, you know, those, the children of the other teammates, um, my dad's teammates, they were like my cousins, and like uh, the, the players were like uncles, and you know, um, it's that sort of thing. We created our own family, and then to have the extended family of the fans was just a really special thing for everybody because, um, you know, they, they just were, just embraced um, the players like they were family, and um, you know, it was... Um, it's a great place to live. I mean, I've chosen to make it my home. I've lived in a lot of different places myself and um, always, you know, come back to Philly. I have, um, you know, I think once you have roots um, and like like you mentioned, um, you know, people raise families here. And um, I don't know of too many who returned to where they were from. Um, I, off the top of my head, I all I can tell you, though, is that maybe some of them in the off-season go back you know, to Canada or Sweden or, you know, wherever they're from um, to visit family and, and to golf and fish and do that kind of stuff. But um, this is a really special place. And, um, you know, 40 years after, you know, winning the cup, you know, these guys are, are still loved so much. Um, you know, I was talking to, when I was doing my book, I was uh, talking with Bob Kelly and, and Bernie Prawn and, and, you know, Dave Schultz and, and just said, you know, these people just, still love us even today and so I think it's just that sense of family and community that they know is special here and they wouldn't find too many other places. Well the other thing is and you kind of mentioned it we were talking uh, while we were getting set up here uh, off air and 
not to say specifics of what we were talking about, but say you can obviously speak of being a daughter of a Flyers legend or one of them. Uh, safety concerns growing up. Do you think your parents had? Because parents are going to worry about their children no matter what. But do you think your mom and dad had issues concerning you and your siblings because of what dad did for a living? Well, I think it was a really different time then in, in, uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think, like today um, and in recent years, you know, the, that um, professional athletes are so much like celebrities. Um, and it just seems like there's a lot more access between, like, the internet and, you know, um, just, um, the average bear has, you know, so much more insight into people's private lives, and it's got to be increasingly more difficult to keep things private. Um, we didn't have that, and I'm grateful, um, I'm very grateful that we didn't have that kind of, um, you know, celebrity, I mean, it was, you know, on um, a different scale, I would say. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there's always concerns with that, but I think that my parents were um, really good about surrounding themselves with really good people and having, you know, there's a lot of people that kind of had our back. Um, I think that, you know, they were, um, and to this day, I mean, they've really stayed true to their values and their roots, and they don't, um, you know, they don't enjoy the spotlight very much, so, um, you know, they've been able to just kind of cruise along under the radar as much as possible, and have just, they taught us from an early age just to be um, really smart about, about things and about people. Um, I know that I've, um, I've grown up to be able to be a, a pretty good judge of character, um, you know, a, when you grow up, not sharing and not sure um, what people want from you, whether it's they like you because of your dad, or they want tickets, or they like you because of you, or you know, when you don't know, you have to you have to hone that skill of you know figuring people out. And um, so I I feel lucky that I grew up with that because it, it served me well over the years. So it was definitely a life lesson for yourself, uh, especially and. People know with being a female, there's already enough, how do I put this, uh, you scrutinize yourself enough at certain times of your life, let alone, like you said, do they like me for me, like especially whether it's your teenage years or whatever, you go, yeah, you're asking questions, do they like me for me, is it my looks, is it this, is it that, you know, is it because of my father, like, and stuff you address, but, you know, so you definitely had to hone those skills. Yeah. But do you think the other thing, which most people hate talking about, is today's athlete, the money. Where you're, not to say your your father wasn't successful, but during his playing days, he wasn't making the 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year. And he was your, and a lot of those guys, not just hockey, but a lot of those guys were your average Joes. You know, they lived in that normal home, normal neighborhood normal cars, all the, you know, they, you weren't talking about mansions and all the other stuff. Do you think that helped as well, having an, I guess, a across-the-board normal lifestyle? Well, yeah, well Or yeah. more normal than you would today? Right, well, see, I, I mean, it's always, it's so funny because people always, that's the first question they usually ask me is, you know, what was it like growing up with your dad, you know, being who he was, and, you know, I have nothing to compare it to. So, um, I can tell you this much is that those guys... Um, when they were playing, not just my dad's era, but for quite some time, and I think actually even players I I talked to, you know, that are current players, they, but but particularly before money got so huge, you know, and it was, you know, it was huge in other sports before, you know, hockey was sort of the last one to be touched by um, all of that, but um, they were so grateful to be able to do something that they loved for a living, like they almost couldn't believe they were getting paid at all, because they'd be playing hockey anyways, you know, so to them it was like, you got to be kidding me, this is awesome, and I get a paycheck to do this, so there was, a, I think, a level of um, just gratitude, and, you know, just, um, there was no need for any kind of, uh, 
you know, and hockey players by nature just don't have that that showy, you know, show off kind of mentality by and large. Um, they just, you know, they they were happy to uh, be able to take care of their families and to, you know, their primary goal was to um, stay healthy so they could, you know, continue to please the fans night after night. Um, they wanted to make Mr. Snyder happy. And um, so I guess, yeah, growing up, I mean, it was as, as normal as a uh, childhood as I can I could possibly imagine. I mean, there were times that it was difficult. Like uh, I, I mentioned to you, um, I wasn't alive when, I wasn't born yet when they, um, they won the Cups. And I know that that was, you know, a really crazy time. Um, I'm, I'm bummed I missed out on it, but I'm looking forward to the next time we win. Um, but when it really became, um, I would say, less normal of a childhood is when my dad um, was in the front office and he was constantly being scrutinized in the news. Um, I was old enough to know uh, it's really, really hard when, um, as a kid, to hear people saying awful things about your dad all the time. It wasn't just in Philly. Um, we were with the North Stars for two years and also uh, with the Florida Panthers for one year. So I actually, and this adds to the abnor abnormality of my childhood, um, I went to three different high schools in four years in three different states. And um, when we went out to Minnesota, there was, they were only getting 5,000 people at a game. Um, the seats were virtually empty, um, and the team was terrible. And after the two years of being there with um, uh, Bob Ganey as the, as the coach, um, and um, you know, we were able to make it to the finals the second year. But I mean, it was horrible. The press can be so cruel, and, and you know, it's part of the job, and the guys get that, but it's tough for kids. Um, I remember one time in particular, I was brand new at this school in Minnesota, and um, it was a Catholic school, and we didn't have locks on our lockers. And I remember walking in one morning, and there was a whole cluster of, of boys, you know, kind of the, the cool kids giggling and stuff, kind of waiting for me to come in, and I was just, you know, I was already nervous as the new kid and stuff, I, I made, you know, I had friends, but it was, you know. Still getting your feet wet in this yeah, situation. Yeah, I was like in eighth grade, you know, so I mean, it was a nerve-wracking time as it was, and um, I opened up my locker, and they had taped a Sports Illustrated um, open, and it showed all the empty seats. At, um, at the stadium, you know, at the rink, and I'll never forget, the title was called Fallen Stars, and at the time, North Stars Arena, I believe it was the Met Center then, their seats were green, gold, and, and white, um, you know, so when you see all of these empty seats, green, gold, and white, and that, and that was, you know, they're basically kind of testing me to see what I would think, and, you know, I got my courage up and I turned around and I said I'll make a bet with you that we'll, um, we'll make it to the Stanley Cup playoffs, you know, by the time my dad's contract is up because it was a two year contract and um, I think the only reason I had the nerve to do that was because my dad, ha I'd heard my dad made the same bet with the, with the owner at the time, Norm Green so <laughs> I kind of, I felt confident enough to do it. If like, dad's saying yeah. this I, I can do it. Yeah, but it was good you know, it was just a good natured ribbing but I mean there are things like that are, are that are difficult. A lot of people don't um, really, you know, in any sport though, like when a guy gets traded, you know, in Philly, we might be like, oh, well, I'm glad we got rid of that bum. What they don't think about really is that, you know, his kids, that bum's kids have to move, you know, across the country and start a new school, usually in the middle of the school year, and, and his wife's got to scurry around and find a new house. And It's not just a threat in them. Right, yeah, and um, it's, it's, tough for kids to hear bad things um, being said. I remember going to a game um, before we went to Minnesota um, and seeing a guy with a sign in in our section holding up a sign that said Clark must go. And I was so upset. I was like 12, you know, and I was so upset. My mom's like, don't worry about it. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, you know. But so to, that was a, a long-winded way to answer your question, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
Well, the other thing I'm thinking about, too, because of what you said there in the long-winded mm -hmm. uh, response, was, as, like you mentioned, growing up, uh, there wasn't what we have today, you know, the internet and 24-hour sports channels and different outlets to see some of these athletes, even though they are treated like uh, celebrities. Uh, do you think, were your parents able to shelter you from things, certain things like newspapers or if, like if dad knows something, like coming from the office, yep, I might get some heat for something, whether it's justified or not might be able to shelter the kids say, so they don't see dad getting beat up for doing or not doing his job depending on how the public took it. Sure. Well, there was, um, I won't, I won't name uh, names, but there was definitely um, one radio station in particular that was, um, I wouldn't say forbidden from our house, but um, my mom would listen to it occasionally. My dad would be like, why are you listen to that? You know, you're not going to... Drive yourself here. nuts, kind of. Yeah. Um, for me, I think more so it was older kids in school saying stuff to me. Like, um, you know, I remember, for example, um, when uh, Mike Keenan got fired, who, um, whatever your opinion of him, I was, I... I I only can speak from a personal opinion and that guy is awesome. He's a really great guy. And, um, you know, he would be at our house on Christmas Eve singing Christmas carols around the piano with us and, like, being um, really stunned when people came, you know, I remember these older boys, you know, kind of uh, picking on me a little bit, like, how could, your, how could your dad fire him? And I was thinking to myself, I oh, I don't know, how could he? That was his friend, you know? But I was so young, like, I didn't, you know, you don't... You just understand. knew the guy personally yeah. from your interaction from Yeah, him. and you don't understand it's a, it's a business decision, you know, because you don't understand business. I was probably in sixth, fifth or sixth grade when it happened. Um, then, you know, there's, um, I, you know, my parents, I think, really tried very hard to shelter us from um, things that I think that they thought were... Um, probably more significant than uh, they didn't really consider um, people talking trash significant. But things like when Telly Lindbergh passed away. Um, well, we'll get in that because okay. we're going to have to take a break because okay. we want to talk about uh, some more historic, actual historical moments. And okay. I know you said you want to bring up about Pelly as one of the things that you noticed. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely there's a lot of certain things that are, you know moments, especially in the Philadelphia sports history, that Jackie can attest to, but definitely there are certain things that you want to preview at Pelly's death, that how do you explain certain things to children to begin with, let alone the magnitude due to his job. So let's take a quick break, a uh, couple commercials, and we'll come right back. I like the play. Drop the verse. It's going down, face of black street. The homies got at me, collab creations. Bump like me out. These days, there's no shortage of people ready to tell you what to do. I'm not one of those people because I'm here to talk about Yingling Lager from America's oldest brewery. A company that was told what to do several times over and generally ignored the advice. I could say that that's a reason to drink it, but that's your call. Some folks like beer that stands for something, others like beer that tastes like something. If you're looking for taste, look for the rich amber color of Yingling Lager. It's a sign of a well-crafted, distinctly satisfying lager. If you want a beer that stands for something, consider the beer that stood for something since 1829. For six generations, Yingling has chosen brewing right over brewing big every time. Yingling just stands for beer. It says something about Yingling Lager and the people who drink it. I won't tell you what to drink, but think about it. We've survived for 185 years because we make darn good beer. Yingling, American-owned, family-operated. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Hey, music fans. If you're in the Philadelphia, South Jersey area on October 16th, swing by Adventureland Store at the Voorhees Town Center in Voorhees, New Jersey to be a part of a very special meet and greet with Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. The event will be from 6 to 8 p.m. along with the signing the band will also be doing a live acoustic set. Come and get your copy today of the band's new CD, Girl, and have it signed. 
Details will be available at AdventureLandStore.com. Hey, brother, this is Devon Duffy of the Duffy Boys, Team 3D, whatever you want to call me. But you're listening to the top radio show in the world, the Crazy Train Radio. And my brother, that I will testify to. Oh, testify. talk about some, let's just talk moments in general, because obviously going into break day, we mentioned about a negative event too, but so we'll just talk important history uh, moments would you, you notice within flyer uh, history, but, and obviously I'll be uh, mentioning some other events as well, but let's stick for this portion of flyer stuff. Do uh, you want to get into that Pelly Lindbergh story? Sure, well when you had mentioned, uh, you know, you'd ask um, whether or not my my parents tried to shelter us from certain things, um, you know, I was saying that they they didn't really consider um, you know any trash talking, uh, for lack of a better term, um, about my dad's decision making um, as a GM. Um, they didn't consider that significant, you know, what the peanut gallery had to say about you know if they agreed with a, a trade or not or that sort of thing. Things that they considered significant had to do with, um, you know, like uh, when when Pelly was killed, which was, I mean, a tragic um, beyond words. I mean, uh, the fact that he was, um, you know, an incredible goaltender and was uh, up and coming was just. You that's know, here. That's you yeah. know, professionally speaking, that's you know, yeah. is what it is. People obviously know what he was capable of. And unfortunately, can only predict what he could have done. Exactly. But let's talk about the personal side of things. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, did you know Pelly at all, or how did? What I, kind? Of? I think. I mean, I was. I was. I think only seven or eight when when he died. Um, but the um, the one of the passengers in in the car with him um, was really really good friends of our family. It still is to this day. Um, he survived, and um, his parents um, are still really good friends with my parents. So there was that added layer of it really hitting so close to home. But, you know, Pelly was so young, and, and any time there's a, 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 a life cut short, you know, he's only 26 years old. If you think about that, you know, uh, he had his whole life ahead of him, and, you know, he was engaged to be married and had all these wonderful things happening. and. You know, um, that less than, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, that accident, um, I think, held a lot of, uh, like, a lifelong lesson in that, you know, um, uh, just how precious life can be. And, you know, he was, I myself was guilty of this as well. As, you know, like, a lot of people are, when you're young, you think you're invincible, um, drive too fast or you, you know, you take chances and you take risks that you, that you shouldn't. I think about some of the things that I did that were pretty dumb. Now, do you um, think of that just because you've gotten older or do you think about that now because as a parent, some, wow, I made some decisions that I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> well, I think definitely getting older, um, you know, as I, you know, came out of my 20s and, um, you know, I, I guess I, I kind of grew up. I was a little bit of a late bloomer, maybe, but I think at about like 28 or so is when I, I really things clicked. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, yeah, I think that um, then you, when you become a parent, of course, it's a whole new ball game. 
insofar as like you definitely want um, to make sure that they don't do the stuff that you did um, because you know you see things from like the whole the whole world is a potential um, you know accident waiting to happen and you know I've got a severe case of uh, mama bear syndrome so I try to you know I have I have boys so I try to you know let boys be boys um, you know I know that they're going to you know give me gray hair as they get older but um but yeah I mean there's there's those things like having um, you know the that accident with with Kelly and then the accident with um, Tortigny that happened um, when they were um, that was the summer I graduated from college um, and that was horrific too I mean there I think that like you know we, we talked about the Flyers family and and um, like we talked about earlier and it it really um, impacted uh, everyone as if it were a family member, really. Do you, re do you remember uh, your father, obviously, was in the front office at the time uh, of this particular accident? Uh, maybe not so much because it may have been middle of the night, early morning. Uh, him getting a phone call and him, or at least remember him trying to sit you down and not say, hey, about explaining to somebody that worked for him, hey, this serious thing happened. It wasn't. It wasn't my dad. I don't remember exactly where he was. It was my mom. I remember. Um, I used to love, like a lot of little girls do. I used to love when my uh, my parents would get dressed up to go out. Um, I'd love to watch my mom putting on her makeup and her, you know, pretty dress or whatever. And I remember sitting in my usual spot in the bathroom watching her get ready. And I remember it just, she couldn't, she couldn't put on her makeup. Like, she just, tears were just streaming down her face. And So they were actually getting ready to go out? They were actually getting ready to go to the funeral. And uh, my dad was, my dad's a man of few words as it is. And, and when it comes to something like that, I don't think that he, I mean, I think that they were all so stunned and so heartbroken. Um, you know, there was... They were, when you talk about my parents sheltering us from things like that, for example, they would have never let us come to the funeral for something like that. Like they were, and like you said, there they were still trying to, I guess, what they use in psychology now is still process something serious like that themselves. Because how can you explain? There, there's, and as many of the listeners know, there's things that adults don't get. Let alone, how are you going to explain? Them, or try to explain them to your children. Right, exactly. So I think that, you know, they they try to keep, you know, those kinds of things at an arm's length um, from us. And they really want us to have as normal of a childhood as possible. Um, and, um, and, you know, then when it was age appropriate, explain things to us. But were they, were they good? And we obviously we got change uh, gears and talk happy because okay. there are a lot of positive moments but if you were to guys were to ask questions uh, but I can obviously ask you uh, if you had a question were they open to try obviously age appropriate answer your question sure yeah um, like I remember when um, my dad got um, got fired um, you know I was 12 and I remember you know it was just just a, a game changer. I was so shocked, and there was just tons of flower deliveries, and, and, you know, it was almost like a funeral in itself, you know, and I just remember being really sad and confused, like, wait a second, you know, uh, I don't understand what Dad didn't happened. die, he just lost his job. Yeah. And Not to make light of yeah, it, but... Yeah, and, and even my parents being like, this is, like, a little over the top, but, like, my dad was, you know, basically like okay with things he understood that this is business and I think other people had a harder time with it than, than he actually did but as a, a kid I remember um, I had been playing tennis with my best friend and I came in and I remember thinking it was um, my you know my parents were in the kitchen and it wasn't unusual for my dad to be home during the day I mean if they were going on a road trip or you know I mean he was home at all different Time. You you were used to because that was what you grew up with. He if he was around during the day or whatever, it's it was what it was. Yeah, but there was just you know there was a vibe. There was a different um, mood, and um, 
I remember then that was the time when they, I don't know, I don't remember where my brother and my sister were. I know my older brother was uh, away at boarding school, but um, I remember them sitting, you know, me down and, and explaining, you know, dad lost his job, and um, I was like, oh my gosh, and I had all sorts of questions, what does this mean, and you know, they said, well, we might have to move, and you know, they just, they were, but they, they really downplayed everything, and they still do to this day, like, and I think that's a really important thing to grow up with, and I hope to pass it on to my kids, that it's okay, we're going to get through Th- Things happen in life, you know, You'll get and not life. just in sports, but, yeah. yeah, life is life. So, anyway, what were some of the other things you wanted to bring up as well? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, turning to a happier subject, um, some of my, I get asked a lot um, about what my favorite um, things about hockey are, my favorite uh, fires memories. Um, I guess I could tell you my three most favorite things about the sport are, um, I love shorthanded goals. Okay. I love when it's someone's first NHL goal. You know, because you just, they're so pumped, you know, and I love when they announce this is so-and-so's uh, first goal, and, you know, you can just, you can just feel like that, um, you know, that exuberance of, you know, a, a kid that's worked hard for, you know, a lot of years to finally get there, and, and so you're just so happy for them. Even if it's a, a player on the opposing team, I, I'm always, I'm always happy for them. Um, the other thing I think is really neat is when, you know, there's a slap shot, and they show the slow motion and, you know, the water bottle doing a flip in the air, you know, because the shot was so hard. I think that's uh, that's always really cool. Um, I guess, actually, a fourth thing would be I love, absolutely love the Winter Classic. Um, I went to the one in Boston, which was phenomenal. Boston did an incredible job um, getting to see the, the Flyers. Um, logo up on the green monster was was really neat. Also, um, Fenway's just you know just an incredible venue, and um, that was just fabulous. Um, then of course when we had it in Philly, I mean that was just bar none. I mean it was. There's not too many cities. I don't know if there's another city really where you would get forty five thousand plus people at an alumni game. I mean that was just incredible. Um, it's just such a testament to Mr. Snyder's legacy and, you know, just the empire he's created here and a testament to how awesome our fans are. I mean, 45,000 or 46,000, however many it was, at an, just an, at an alumni game. I mean, it's just really awesome. Well, well, the thing that I got a kick out of the alumni game, because I was, I was still based in Florida with the show, obviously, and... We had we were still in the planning stages of the show itself, but the thing I got to kick out, obviously being from the area, originally born and raised in the Philadelphia area, I loved the respect that was seen on a big scale for Bernie mm-hmm. after that shift he played yeah. in that. Because obviously, for those who don't know, Bernie Perrant, who was a Hockey Hall of Famer's career, his career was cut short. Uh, which could have been led to a third cup and many believe and all that song and dance. But he, his career was ended short due to an eye injury. So I don't think the fans really got that opportunity for him to naturally end his career and say thank you. And that alumni game at the Winter Classic, like you said, 45,000 strong Where he, after that shift he played, which at, I think he was like 61 or 62 at the time, to get in net. To really, you hear, you see on national TV people going nuts to say thank, hey Bernie, thank you to really get that moment. Actually, I, I think he was sixty-six. Well, right? yeah, 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 but you know what I'm saying, yeah. you know. That, oh, yeah. the but there's still he to give him that sure, yeah. after that ten-minute shift or whatever it was he played. Yeah, he and so rightly deserved to be the the star of the game and to you know have the standing ovations and all that and you know Bernie is such an, an important part of the Flyers franchise and he's just 
I mean, and you know, he's such a character, oh. and, and he's so lovable. Bernie is Bernie. Yeah, yeah, and he's, he, you know, you see him strolling around the concourse, you know, before the games as one of the Flyers ambassadors, and he has time for absolutely everyone. He will um, talk to you and tell stories and sign whatever you'd like him to autograph, and, you know, he's got all the time in the world um, for the people of Philadelphia and, and, you know, just anybody. He's just such a genuinely good guy, and, you know, to touch on what we were talking about before, just one of those guys who's super grateful for the time that he had, and that's why he chose to make this place his home as well, because the people are still to this day are so good to him, and, and he just is... Um, just really happy to have been a part of something really special. Well, obviously you mentioned as well off air, and I guess this can be a big part for as far as flyer history, because uh, obviously we're going to have to take another break for uh, to get some of our uh, contestants on the line. Because for those who don't know, or if it was as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Jackie has been nice enough to autograph a couple books. To give to for the, to honor the start of the new year, on some we're gonna ask some flyer trivia questions. Uh, well, two questions, and the other one is gonna be at the end of the show after Jackie unfortunately has to go play mommy. <laughs> as I kid around about that uh, for the stump the crock uh, segment. Uh, however, though, like I said, Jackie has been nice enough. She's gonna give us a couple books to give away and have signed them. And my dad has signed them also. Ooh, that's a nice one to have. Uh, <laughs> ah, hockey Hall of Famer Bob Clark. Uh, but the other thing I want to bring up was, you know, I was doing some reading again. Obviously, you know, the Homer side of me was follow, always followed the Flyers and whatnot, not the professional side of myself. Uh, I was reading about some guys who may have been not just hockey, but... Well, I, obviously hockey. This is the hockey show. But underrated players. Like, you know how some guys, whether you look at other sports, like a Donovan McNabb or a Jeremy Roenick or this one or that one, or just get all the attention. Uh, can I run some names by you, see what you think? Okay. Uh, some, some of the past guys. Okay. Uh, who I think may have been underrated. John LeClaire. Who's also actually an area resident still. We won't throw that totally under the bus. What did you uh, think of John? I thought he was great. I mean, I, um, I, it's, it's funny. I, I think that there's um, a whole lot of people out there who've probably uh, forgotten more about hockey than I'll ever know. So my expertise, <laughs> if that's what you want to call it, is, <laughs> um, is limited and it's extremely biased. Um uh, I mean, there's people that can rattle off stats like it's their job, um, and uh, that'd be me. Yeah, that I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought he, I thought he was fabulous. I mean, he, it was really exciting to watch. Oh, and speaking of the classic, um, him and Eric Lindros um, yes. scoring. That was phenomenal to see them together again, and and him pass and, and score. I mean, that was that was really cool. Um, I, you know, it was he was such an incredible addition to the team. Uh, and, and you know, and you know what? He he reminds me. I've only, yeah, you know, briefly met your father in passing one time, but no John a, a little better. But John, yeah, you know, the little bit from obviously the stories you've told about your father and that brief encounter with your father that I've had personally. John reminds me a lot like your father. Yeah. Just a real quiet guy. Don't. Yep, you know, nice guy, great guy. But just, you know, like he's not one of the those brat not so much brash in a negative way, but vocal and social and you know what I'm saying, like on the positive side of things. He's not to say those guys are assholes or negative or anything like that. But you know, he, John is like I in a good way, like your father, just well reserved, I guess the best way we'll put it. And definitely just goes about life and that's what we got to do, and whatnot. I guess is the best way to put it. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably my my sister would be better to to speak about that. She has, you know, a, 
a friendship with him that I don't have. Um, their their children, their sons um, have played hockey together over the so years. So yeah, he would know a little. She would know a li- know him a little yeah, better. Yeah, I don't. I don't have. But it just you could see them. just in the in encounters you could see similarities there. Yeah, he's definitely under the radar. I think that he's got a um, you know the, the you know few times I have um, you know spent any time where he was. You know, he was there. I thought he was really funny. Oh, um, yeah. And I thought like I said, that, great yeah, guy, but it's, you Yeah, know. I thought he, I remember thinking he was really funny. And, um, yeah, I think that, you, that you're right. He's, um, he's a laid-back, cool guy. Uh, well, let me ask you. Somebody, same cool guy, great guy, and we'll go a little historical, and I think he's in the book as well, Flyer Lives, uh, Amazon.com. Uh, Dave Schultz. He was a little bit... On the other side, he's, but still an awesome guy, loud, up, up, you know, he's very more, he's, yeah. re- he's always going. Yeah, he's awesome. He's just one of those guys that, I mean, he's got such a, a quick wit, and he's, um, I mean, he really, truly is the life of a party. I mean, when he walks into a room, you certainly know it. And you know Dave's there. Yeah, he's got everyone going and everyone laughing, and he's just, he is literally, you know, I, it's amazing to me. Um, he's, he is such an important part of the franchise, and the fact that he only played for four seasons with us, and, you know, is such an integral He's another guy, like Bernie, who's just, whenever you see him, in, and yeah. he's an area guy and all, yeah. but whenever you see Dave, it's, you go, people still look hammer, you know, yeah. like they... Yeah, he's, I mean, he's such an, he's, a, you know, one of the pillars, the main pillars of the franchise, and, and he, again, is one of those guys, he just has a lot of gratitude um, for having had the experience, and one of the cool things was when, when I was writing um, this book and interviewing him, I mean, I found out so many neat, interesting facts about these guys that, you know, you just... Um, you don't read about, uh, or, you know, I uncovered a lot of really interesting things, and the thing about, about Dave is that he wasn't a fighter. He was He was a, a scorer. Yeah. He, he coming up in the minors yeah. and all, yes. He was a leading scorer, and then, you know, and, and it's funny, same thing with Paul Holmgren, he was never a fighter either, and then they both became these huge enforcers, but um, he's just, yeah, Dave's a really, really nice guy, and um, <laughs> <laughs> he's I'm laughing because, not because of what she said. As soon as she mentioned Holgram, I'm thinking of a story I heard we'll get to when she finishes up with Dave. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, he's got a great sense of humor, and yes. um, he's, uh, he's definitely um, a prankster. He's, he reminds me a lot like Bernie. He's on that side of things, where he's an awesome guy, but he's... you got to watch out for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but in a fun, good way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely a guy you wouldn't want to mess with. Uh, like you said... Paul Ho- we got to end this portion with Paul Holmgren, the current general manager and whatnot. But like you said, when he came here as a player, he wasn't an enforcer or anything like that. However, do you remember, would you notice a story from when you were doing a book or otherwise, why they put that gate there in the spectrum near the locker rooms? Because I obviously you've been to the Spectrum and know the area I'm talking about. Right. No, I mean, I didn't touch on that, uh, no, in the book. I did not. But do you at least know of what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Because obviously I'll check into it and talk about it later on in the general history of hockey and interesting topics. But let's just say Homer, during one of the games... uh, Leaving a game or being asked to leave, the reason that gate is there. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll leave it at that for right now. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And, but uh, let's take a break, one more break, and we will finish up the hockey history as far as Jackie is concerned uh, with some of the, the trivia for some of the other, or the, both trivia questions for two out of three books. Okay. Good. We, we will be right back.
Hey music fans, if you're in the Philadelphia, South Jersey area on October 16th, swing by Adventureland store at the Voorhees Town Center in Voorhees, New Jersey to be a part of a very special meet and greet with Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. The event will be from 6 to 8 p.m. along with the signing. The band will also be doing a live acoustic set. Come and get your copy today of the band's new CD Girl and have it signed. Details will be available at AdventurelandStore.com. Like tailgating, stock car racing, and the blues, Yingling is purely American. Like neighborhood hardware stores and local diners, Yingling is a family business. And just like talking football, politics, or beer, Yingling is no nonsense. Yingling is like a lot of things, but our lager is unlike anything else. It's a true American lager, purely independent in a way that's hard to find these days in a way that's avoided every superficial fad and fancy distraction that doesn't have to do with making great beer. Maybe that's what's made Yingling Lager kind of an icon. It's no frills, no shortcuts. Beer that's all about the beer. Refreshing, isn't it? It says something about Yingling and the people who drink it. Ask for it on tap or in bottles wherever you go and get a taste for yourself of an American original. Think about it. We've survived for 185 years by making darn good beer. Yingling Lager, from America's oldest brewery. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Welcome to Hockey Fan Knows Best, where we're going to find out if two local hockey fans really know their team for great prizes. Let's find out if these two lucky callers really know their Philadelphia Flyers and their Philadelphia Flyer history. Jersey, hello. Oh, hello. Hey, who's yes. this? Uh, Todd. Todd, obviously you're calling about the Flyer Lives book. You're here with the Croc and Jackie Clark, author of such book. Uh, well, real simple. Got a question for you. You answer it, you get a copy of the book. All right? Sweet. Nice. Okay. All right. There was a... The Philadelphia Flyers had a short-lived mascot who was with the Flyers and not the Phantoms in 1976. What was the name of that mascot? If I'm not mistaken, as much of a Flyers fan as I am, I would have to say that the mascot's name is Slapshot. Oh, that's impressive. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Are you? Were you just saying that, or were you uh, trying to put two and two together? Because around that same time period, there was a hockey movie called Slapshot. One of the greatest movies ever made. Are you sure? <laughs> what was that? I said, uh, I said no. I'm, I'm pretty well well rounded with uh, my flyers, and uh, I know that they did at one time have a mascot, and that was his name. Well, um, what part of Jersey are you from? What part of Jersey? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Gloucester City, more southern. Okay, sorry to hear that, you know, but outside of Philadelphia, correct? Yes. All right, well, we have your contact information, sir, Mr. Todd. Thank you for calling. Thanks, Todd. All right, thank and we you. Will get that. It was a pleasure. I can't wait to read the book. See, you got, you got Jackie's agent talking in the background, so uh, <laughs> we, will, 
We will get you that forecast shortly. We have your information. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Florida. So you are calling to participate for Flyer Lodge book. You ready to go with this trivia question? Yes. All right. The Philadelphia Flyers have retired five numbers during the team's tenure. Name three out of the five. One, two, four, seven, and sixteen. There's them all. names to those besides the one, two, four, seven, sure. and sixteen. Sure. Perrant, Hal, Ashby, Clark, and Barber. And I think uh, Jackie knows the one that's sixteen, right? You've met, right? <laughs> yeah, we've met. <laughs> so as as we said, you are getting Jackie's book, which will be autographed, uh, Why Your Lives, and it was Triumphant Books, correct? Triumph Books, yes, they out of Chicago, and actually, um, four of the five are in the book. Um, I interviewed uh, 20, uh, 20 or so of the most popular, past and current um, players, and um, obviously, Mr. Ashley has been passed, but the rest of them are in the book, um, uh, Bernie, um, Mark, um, Bill Barber, and my dad. So, um, each one has their own chapter, so um, hopefully you'll enjoy reading about them. Uh, but we got to ask you real quick, what part of Florida are you calling from currently? Uh, Port Canaveral, just north of yeah, the so What do you do out in Port Canaveral? I'm sorry? What do you do out in Port Canaveral there? Uh, work for Victory Casino Cruise. The, uh, ah. The ah, so you work with the, the United States. Water. Yes. Ah, so you work with a former sponsor, R, so you'll have to say hello to Mr. Pete Lynch there for us. I will definitely do so. All right. It sounds good. We have your contact information, and we will uh, get that book out to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Well, obviously, it is time to wrap up with Miss Jackie with Miss Jackie Clark. It's fine. Uh, her. Her representatives, if you hear some noise in the background, are here and telling her that the, t the check we gave her only uh, required a certain amount of time. So, yes, Mr. Agent, we, we will wrap up with her. Uh, Jackie, thank you again. And hopefully, do you have anything uh, with the book appearances or anything coming up? Uh, not right now, but I'll definitely let you know um, as soon as I do. And thank you so much for having me. It's always so much fun to... to uh Get together with you guys. Um, I really appreciate it, and I hope that um, your listeners like the book um, and enjoy it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Uh, is there now? Can you get that on Amazon as well? Sure, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, you can get it on Triumph Books. Yeah. Triumph Books um, out of Chicago. Um, Triumphbooks.com. Um, pretty much anywhere where um, where uh, books are sold, really. Um, and you just can Google Jackie Clark, um, of course, with an E on the end, and um, you'll find um, local booksellers as well. Well, obviously, the agents are complaining, so we will have to let Miss Jackie Clark go, and thank you again. As you go through life, you're faced with a decision. Should I fit in, or should I stand out? Blending in tends to be easier and safer. 
But there's something bold, something honest about standing out when you do it for the right reasons. For things you believe in, things that are important, things like beer. That's why we started brewing Yingling Light Lager. For more than 40 years, big beer corporations have dominated the market with their idea of light beer. Each one is pale and forgettable as the next. We believe it's time for something different. Not for the sake of being different, for the sake of being beer. A lower calorie beer with a true lager taste. The result is 99 calories, 100% lager. With a rich amber color unlike any other light beer. It's light beer that makes a statement, and we're happy to make it. Next time you order a light beer, make a statement of your own. Think of it as a declaration of independence. With Yingling Light Lager, rethink your light beer. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Hi, I'm Larry Holmes, and you're listening to Crazy Train Radio. Fair knockout. All right, guys, coming out of break, we actually have, uh, as we said in the opening, uh, John Bork from CSN Philadelphia on the line. John, what's going on? How are you guys? Good to be with you. Good. Uh, well, obviously, we were just briefly talking. Uh, past couple of games to start off the season have been rough for uh, Philadelphia, correct? It's uh, almost a uh, direct... Uh copy from what we saw last season when they started 0-3 and scored three goals in those first three games. <laughs> well, I shouldn't laugh, but, you know, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, for those who aren't in the Philadelphia area, John Bork uh, does pre- and post-game uh, for Comcast Sportsnet for the Philadelphia Flyers. He also does segments for their uh, nightly show as well, correct? Yeah, whatever they want me to do, uh, you know. Um Anchor uh, on Sportsnet 6 and 10 and uh, Flyers. But during the hockey season, Flyers is obviously uh, my uh, my main priority. Okay. Well, uh, first question for you, because obviously you're close to a lot of Flyers and front office and talk to a lot of people in the organization. What has been the response for the realignment of the league? Well, I think from an organizational standpoint – uh, it doesn't really change anything that they do. I don't think they look at it and break it down maybe uh, in a way that we might. I think obviously they know with uh, uh, with two divisions where there's eight teams as opposed to the two Western Conference divisions where you have seven teams, it's going to be a little bit tougher in the East for now until they decide uh, that they want to bring in two more teams and then balance it all out. Uh, so, and then when you obviously bring over Detroit and you bring over Washington and, and bring in what appears to be an up-and-coming Columbus team, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a division that now has gotten a little bit tougher. And when you're talking about only three of the eight teams guaranteeing a playoff spot, and then if you don't obviously break into that top three that you're trying to position yourself into a wild card, I mean, it's going to be very competitive. Uh, and, you know, I didn't even throw in the, the, the New York Islanders. So um, I don't think that they really think about the whole division all that much um, because their travel doesn't change, very little changes. Um, you know, they just pretty much, uh, you know, the, the goal is the same. And you, you just, instead of trying to, to, to make your way into that top eight now, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned one thing that I had recently saw at the beginning of the season a couple of days ago in an article by the Sports Business Journal, and first and foremost, the wild card format. For those who don't understand it, what what do you know of this? Uh, essentially, the top three uh, teams in each division are awarded playoff berths. Then everybody else in the conference, so you've know, you, you got a 16-team Eastern Conference. Well, the top three in each division – uh, get the uh, automatic bid, the top three seeds. Uh, uh, so there's six out of uh, 14 teams. Well, then you got two wild card uh, berths. Now they can come, you know, uh, from one division, or they, or, or there could be a team from uh, each division. Uh, so it's really it's it's the next two best point totals are the two teams that get the wild card spot. So we could see five playoff teams out of the Metropolitan Division, or we could just see just three. Well, the interesting part is uh, I also noticed in this article as well was 
obviously the wild card, which you just mentioned. All teams are going to be playing all teams, but which leads to new rivalries and also some old ones being uh, connected as well. But also it throws uh, fire into or uh, gas into the fire there for season-ending big games. So how do you feel on that? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, uh, I don't know if there's any if, if there's any big shakeup in terms of the Metropolitan Division where the Flyers are because we're all, we've already seen some really good rivalries established with the Rangers and the Penguins, the Devils, um, maybe Washington because of their proximity to Philadelphia. But I think really in the other division. Now that you bring Detroit over, and Detroit's obviously uh, the Red Wings organization's been wanting to play in the Eastern Time Zone for several years now. Uh, I think you're gonna see, you'll see some more rivalries develop within themselves and Boston and Toronto. You know, back in the day, Detroit Toronto was a huge rivalry. You know, when it was the original six. So you're restoring some of the rivalries from years past, and I believe this is the first time since I think I read 1972-73 where Detroit and Boston have been in the same division again. So you're sort of renewing a little nostalgia uh, in that sense. So uh, it makes it for a, a little bit more competitive conference, and which I think is always a good thing. Well, And the obviously big thing that I uh, registered with as far as the Journal's article was the amount of increase of profits compared to the last full season before the strike, which they were talking of a possibility 10% increase. So, uh, and within revenues? What was that? You said within revenues? I, 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 because I'm not. Yeah, I'm not it would be about a 10% increase they're looking at. Okay. Compared well, to the last full season before the strike. Okay, well, that, that, that makes sense. Um, you know, you're getting in a full season, too. I think that, you know, you look back at the uh, strike-shortened season, that uh, I think it turns some people off. But, you know, I, I think that uh, the core hockey fan has always been right there for this league, and I believe attendance uh, was pretty strong last year. And now that the salary cap is down, um, you know, there, there's, there's more of a concentration where – of making sure that even some of these smaller market teams can still turn some some semblance of a profit. I mean, that's been the problem is that, you know, you, when you look at from 1 to 30, the, rev, the, the real revenue generators in this in this league are really, there's only about three or four teams, and that's Toronto, Montreal, and the Rangers. Uh, outside of that, it, it's everybody's, you know, is having a hard time. It's more difficult. Um, but there, those three organizations pretty much generate the majority of revenue for the entire league. Uh, well, the other thing that was very interesting going into the first day of the season, last Tuesday and Wednesday, or first days, I, I should say, was the players approving the hybrid icing rule. For those who don't understand that rule, what is your understanding, understanding of that rule? Uh, the hybrid icing essentially goes like this. Whenever uh, a puck is, uh, is in the process of being ice, where it clears over, uh, you know, the red line and then over the goal line, instead of let, letting the defensive player come back and touch the puck, called, you know, essentially, uh, touch up icing, uh, once they get to the face-off zone in, uh, the defensive side, or when they get to the face-off dot, uh, in the defensive side of the ice, then that, they blow the play dead. So once a player, instead of, say, touching the puck, once you get to that face-off dot, you know, if you were to draw an imaginary line, uh, through the face-off dots, once they cross that line, they blow the whistle. And that, that's essentially the only, um, the only difference in, in really what hybrid icing is. You know, it, it, you, you look in international play, uh, come Olympic time, uh, they blow it once it crosses the goal line. And so it doesn't even get that far. So hybrid icing, if you want to take it, it's somewhere in the middle between touch-up icing, where is what we saw last season, and, uh, you know, where they uh, essentially an international play where they, they blow it dead once the puck actually crosses the goal line. So this sort of falls right in the middle. Uh, well, since you covered the Flyers, has anybody that you've spoken with Player-wise, been vocal about this uh, rule change? Uh, you know, not to the point of where they just adamantly are defiant against it. 
I think that uh, they realize w w where the emphasis is behind it, and that is to try to protect the players. And you know, when you're talking about guys charging hard for the puck, and and you know, they're, they're, you're always susceptible to injury. So it, it, it you know, you, you may cut down on a few injuries this year because of the hybrid icing situation, where it's not a race to the puck. Um, I think, and there was an incident in uh, the Flyers game against Carolina where I saw where. Uh, Jake Voracek, one of the players, thought that he could have beaten one of the defenders to the puck, but once that defender got to that point that, that we were talking about, the face-off dots, you know, the, the whistle was blown regardless of whether uh, the offensive player could have beaten the defensive player to the puck. It doesn't really matter. You know, uh, first person to, you know, the face-off dot, you know, the whistle's blown. So, you know, it, it's really, I think it's all part of the league's effort to try to make the game a little bit safer. Well, obviously, before we catch our first break with you, John, uh, you mentioned about player injuries and all. And during their home opener, I believe it was, George Paris from Montreal uh, ended up getting into a fight, had a concussion, spent some time in the hospital. Most hockey fans know about this story. Uh, do you think this opened up, opens up a can of worms as far as fighting being eliminated from the game or – where do you stand on this? Well, I don't no, I don't you know, I don't think that the Paros incident alone is going to stir up that conversation. Uh this is something that I think is being thrown around and debated for several years now. And and really I think it what it goes back to if you're looking for a catalyst in this whole discussion, I think you gotta go back to the year the three, four years ago, the off season when you had the three enforcers who um who died, uh, whether it was through suicide, um, you know, Way Belak and Derek Bugard, uh, and, and, and I believe it was Rick Rippon, those three guys. And I think that's when the conversation started because all three of those guys were enforcers. And you're talking about, I mean, I, it opened a lot of eyes in the sense that, um, you know, that, that, that there are some issues out there um, that are perhaps – what they do on the ice is uh, there is some uh, short and possibly even long-term brain injury that's resulting from this, and so well, I is think that's that one of those things, uh, John. That we because we know more about concussions and different things medically now that say we did in the seventies and eighties. I, you know, I, I yeah. I mean, I think that there, there's always more information. There's more research that's being done. You, you see how now. Um, like diseases like you know like ALS is being linked to to concussions a number of 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 uh diseases uh are being linked to it so yeah that there's more information out there i think but i think it's also that the, the the you know the leagues the commissioners of these leagues from the NFL the NHL that they have to to recognize that and they have to take player safety uh as one of the top priorities moving forward and and for hockey, I don't know if that was really the case until you know the last couple of years, and tr really trying to think about how how can we protect the lives of these players, you know, and, and their futures, you know, moving forward. Uh, you know, obviously, the, you're going to have concussions when you're talking about a, a high speed game where sticks and pucks are thrown around. I mean, I don't, is there there wasn't you know there's nothing that you could have done to prevent Ian Laperriere's injury. There's nothing you could have done really to prevent a Chris Pronger injury, but it, 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 does, it seems to be quite the double standard that if the league wants to tie, if they truly want to limit head injuries, uh, that it doesn't make much sense to, to continue to fight in the game. I mean, it's it's uh, it's, it's quite the paradox if you, if you stop and think about it because you know, essentially uh, a, a majority of head injuries are the result of fighting on the ice, and you just mentioned George Peros, and um, it doesn't matter how it, how it shakes out. If, if, if somebody's slamming their their head onto the ice or they're taking repeated punches to the head, uh, it's all the same thing, and then eventually it catches up with you. Well, obviously we know the NHL general managers are going to have, be having a meeting on November 12th in Toronto, so you know you got to figure it's going to be a topic of conversation for sure. Well, and you've already heard some general managers come out, and they're pretty outspoken on it. And I think Carolina's general manager Jim Rutherford had already mentioned that if you want to, you want to see fighting in a sport, you know, go to wrestling or go see it where they actually promote fighting. And I think that it's gotten to a point where um, 
you know, I, I, that, that some of the general managers now, they, they want to refine the game. They want to get away from, you know, the old school of having an enforcer out there. And, and you know, it, we talk about all of this, but we haven't really seen it from the other side as to, to when they do, if, if it ever gets to that point where, Fighting has been outlawed uh, in the National Hockey League, and then what? You know, because you're still going to have hard checks. You're still going to have uh, defensive players who will certainly try to bottle up and keep the other superstar players in check. And then, and then, what are you going to do? So, um, I think it, the debate will continue. I don't think that in this November meeting that it's going to be voted for next season to to implement uh, taking out fighting altogether. But I think they're going to continue to talk about it. And let's hope that uh, they continue to make some steps to to certainly make the game safer. Uh, well, let's take a quick break. We got John Borg from CSN Philly. We, we will be right back. These days, there's no shortage of people ready to tell you what to do. I'm not one of those people, because I'm here to talk about Yingling Lager from America's oldest brewery, a company that was told what to do several times over and generally ignored the advice. I could say that that's a reason to drink it, but that's your call. Some folks like beer that stands for something. Others like beer that tastes like something. If you're looking for taste, look for the rich amber color of Yingling Lager. It's a sign of a well-crafted, distinctly satisfying lager. If you want a beer that stands for something, consider the beer that stood for something since 1829. For six generations, Yingling has chosen brewing right over brewing big. Every time, Yingling just stands for beer. Says something about Yingling Lager and the people who drink it. I won't tell you what to drink, but think about it. We've survived for 185 years because we make darn good beer. Yingling, American-owned, family-operated. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. This is Lex Luger, Total Package, former World Heavyweight Wrestling Champion, and you are listening to the Crazy Train Radio Station. Coming out of break with uh, John Borg from CSN Philly, uh, we were obviously talking about injuries, but this one has nothing to do with concussions. Thomas, uh, the goalie from Pittsburgh, I'm sorry, Thomas Vukin is out for three to six months with a blood clot. Obviously, Pittsburgh's a big rivalry in Philly. How do you think this affects Pittsburgh? Uh, I'm, you're going to have to say it one more time. It was sort of cut off. He's, uh, somebody had an injury. The goalie from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh we were talking about. Oh, was Thomas Bocoon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Um, you know, if, if Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh is so deep um, from their forwards to, to their defense, you know, I, I don't look at just Thomas Bocoon. You know, I, I think that we see Mark andre Fleury struggle. And when you do, I, you know, it's kind of like the NFL. You always want to have two quarterbacks in, in the event that one goes down to injury. Same can be said for your goaltending situation in hockey. You always like to have a very competent backup. Uh, and in the way that we've seen Mark andre Fleury, he, he's such an up-and-down roller coaster sort of guy that, um, you know, when he struggles, his game kind of goes south in a hurry. But, you know, he's the type of player that uh, he, he works his way out of it. And when he does, it, it, who knows, you know, he, he, he does a good job of, of pulling himself out and getting his A game back. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh just needs a competent backup. Um, you know, it's hard to lose a guy when you're a week into the season because all the backups have already been – competent backups have already been snatched up. And unless you got somebody who's really solid – Within your system, um, you know it, it could be a significant uh, downgrade in talent. But Pittsburgh's Pittsburgh, and uh, you know they continue to play the way that they play, and that is, uh, you know, to play in the offensive uh, end of the ice. Really, doesn't matter who's 
the goaltender in net on many of those nights because they're typically not going to be as as worked as the, as the uh, the goalie that's actually facing the Penguins. So I, losing Vokun, I don't think is really going to phase them all that much. Uh, that being said, if they lose Flurry, you know, then they, they there could be some concern out there. Well, was that something that, from what you've heard that? They found during training camp, or was he? He came into camp not feeling well. What have you heard on the situation? Yeah, I don't. I I, I don't. I haven't heard anything. I, I don't know any more than probably than what you've read uh, regarding the injury. I I do know that I have covered Thomas Vokun before during my time in Nashville, and the one thing that when I did hear this is that that he had a similar situation uh, to this when he was in Nashville. So this I don't believe is the first occurrence. Of, of a blood clot or blood clotting that Thomas Vokun has had to deal with. Yeah, it's, it's a tough situation overall. But uh, on to something a little possible. Uh, you mentioned him earlier when we were talking about the realignment. Toronto re-signing their uh, superstar, Phil Kessel, for an eight-year deal. I think it was $64 million. What does locking somebody like that up for Toronto mean? Well, I think Phil Kessel's is easily uh, – he, he, he's got 40-goal potential. And now with the new CBA and you take a look at some of the contracts that are being handed out there, the superstar players, and, you know, if you've got a top 20 score on your team, a perennial top 20 score, they're going to command an upwards of seven and a half to eight and a half million dollars per season. And we saw, you know, you just look over the past year, some of the contracts that have been hammered out, you know, there's Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry in Anaheim. You got Giroux here in Philadelphia, um, and and now with a guy like Phil Kessel, that was pretty much that's pretty much the, the the going rate for a guy of his caliber and and the number of goals and the number of points that he puts up. And you know, you lose a guy like that to free agency, it's, it, you're not going to replace him unless you go out there and make another uh, trade like they did to get them. And, 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 and typically teams don't trade those sort of players away unless they're, they're, they're faced with a uh, salary cap pinch. So I think that was a necessary move on the part of the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, they locked up their, their most explosive offensive player, and there's no reason to believe. I mean, Phil Kessel uh, still has is in the prime years of his hockey. Why they shouldn't get that type of production for at least the next three to four years? Well, do the Flyers have anybody that they you think they need to lock up of that potential? Because obviously you got some young talent like a Giroux and – Couple no, I, actually, I think it's the opposite. I think they got too many of those guys locked up. If you take a look at what they've done, and, and you know, I mean, how old Phil Kessel? He's 27, 26, 27. Uh, like that, yes. Yeah, I mean, he's in his 20s. I mean, the Flyers are locking up guys that are in their early to mid-30s. So uh, I think in two or three or four years, I think they're going to be kicking themselves that they've got – uh, a handful of long-term contracts on the book. So there's not anybody out there on, on their roster right now that is deserving of that sort of contract outside of Claude Giroux. Uh, Jake Voracek, I believe, has got another two or three years left. You know, Wayne Simmons has been locked up. Um, you know, the only guy that, that right now is sort of is in limbo after this season is Braden Shen. And right now, you know, I don't know exactly what – Braden Shen's market value is because he hasn't really done anything to warrant a significant raise. Um, still finding his way. He was brought here, I think, as a center. Uh, he has struggled in that role. He's now playing the wing and uh, through three games, he's still trying to find himself. So uh, the Flyers, I think, in a couple of years are going to be faced with, uh, once again, you, you get these guys locked up uh, over multi-years and um, you know, you, you hope to get you know, some quality production out of them. We'll just have to see. Well, there's been a lot of new debuts in the league itself as well, like such as Patrick Waugh coaching out in Colorado, Daniel Alfredson out in Detroit playing. Is there anything that you're looking forward to seeing league-wise? Yeah, I think you're always uh, interested to see some. I, you know, I really like this influx of new players, and it, it – more so now than it's ever been. This is a young, skilled players league. I mean, if you you come into the league and and and, and you you got quickness and you're incredibly skilled and and you've got the natural gifts, 
um, you know, this league is going to showcase it. And, you know, I look, you know, they, I'll give you a team like the Edmonton Oilers. They haven't turned the corner. They're still struggling to, to find their identity, and I, I think that there's a certain grit and toughness. But, you know, you watch their young core players, and they're, they're an exciting team to watch. And, uh, you know, look across the league. Um, you know, I mean, Sidney Crosby's still young. Um, you know, he's what, 25, uh, 20, 26, um, somewhere there, but you, you look at somebody like Sidney Crosby, John Tavares, you know, Giroux still mid, mid twenties. You go up and down, uh, every, you know, every roster and there's some, some good young players. I, you know, I, I like to see Tyler Sagan do good down in Dallas. Um, and, and, you know, you're looking at, at this past draft, uh, the, the talent that came out of this draft is, is supposed to be uh, one of the, the top crops in 10 years. So uh, it's a young man's game. And, and, it, and it, it, it's, uh, if you don't look at if some of the veterans don't look out, some of these guys will sneak up on them. And, and if you can get that right blend of veterans, and I, and I think a team like, you know, take the Chicago Blackhawks. They got a really good blend, but yet their core players and their dynamic players are guys, you know, in their mid twenties, and Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves, and uh, and, and and really, it, it, the, those two are a big reason why they've already won two cups in the past four years. Well, obviously, I got a kick out of it because uh, I mentioned his name, Patrick Waugh, uh, out Colorado as a Hall of Fame player now coaching. Was actually fined ten ten grand over arguing a call. Yeah, is that going to be a good or bad thing that he brings that same passion as a player? I always coaching. Yeah, I always think that if you in in any, I think that the, that the NHL lacks. It's not personality driven. Uh, perhaps where it was twenty years ago, twenty five years ago. I don't think you have the dynamic personalities. I don't think people outside of hockey really have a true sense of who some of these guys are. Um, but I think it's always a good thing. You know, any any time somebody comes in with, you, you I, I I I never want to see fire and passion, and somebody who who has real emotion for what they do to, to have her have that channeled and to, you know and so if if what Patrick Waugh is bringing is real and it's intense and it, it leads to a better NHL I'm all for it well going to have to let you go but I have one more question because we're obviously going to be talking about it next segment when we talk about the minors because you covered this guy Thursday as well it was announced that the Skolov had signed with an EHL team out in Vegas, the Wranglers. What happened with him in Philadelphia there? Well, I don't know how much time that we have here to, to dissect. You can uh, say, say what you got to say. We can make it work. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was just a two-year relationship where Ilya Brzezgalov, look, he was a free agent. He said all the right things. He did all the right things to get the contract that he needed to get the long-term security, uh, he did that. The Flyers, you know, for, for lack of a better word, were suckers, and they bought in. They were essentially the only team that was, I think, really bidding for his services. I don't think that Ilya Brzezgalov would have gotten half of what he had gotten here in Philadelphia. The Flyers, I think, were vulnerable coming off the season they came off of and in the series where it was a goalie carousel between uh, Michael Layton and Brian Boucher and Sergei Bobrovsky in that Buffalo series. And it was almost like the perfect storm built up and and management wanted to, to, to go out and, you know, we try to secure the goalie situation. Ilya Brzezgalov came in here, uh, didn't essentially know what he was getting himself into. If you know, if Ilya Briskalov would have just focused on just playing the game, being the best goalie, and I think that's part of it as well. As I don't think Ilya Briskalov is necessarily the hardest worker of any goalie in the NHL. I think he just, you know, he puts in what time he has to and thinks that he'll get by on talent alone. And um, you know, for the, for this franchise at this particular point, and I, I think he got caught up in. And the, the the spotlight, especially that came with the whole 24/7 of the Winter Classic, uh, I think that was a detriment to his time here in Philadelphia, and it just sort of unraveled over time. And I don't think that he could ever get back, could get it back on track. 
and, 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 you know, for the early part, I, I don't think that he was really – I don't think that, that he was hammered as much as he, he claims that he was. I think that he was given a fair shake, and I think people try to, uh, you know, I, I think that people say, hey, look, this is, this is, a, this is a, it's, it's, it's a tough hockey town, but as long as you just come in, you do your job, you play solid, everything, everything I think for the most part will work itself out. He just refused to believe that. Well, obviously, and we know I'm going to have a few other, especially Philadelphia Flyer alumni uh, joining us uh, because of a lot of relationships from that area. But they say pretty much the same thing you said. You've got to come in and earn your respect, especially in a town like Philadelphia, that's for sure. Well, and, and you, you only go about that by working hard, not pointing fingers, you know, taking responsibility, uh, if, if, if whatever you're doing is not working, well, then you work harder to ensure that it does. Um, you know, I, and there's no substitution for, for hard work. You know, there's no shortcuts, especially in the game of hockey. And, you know, no matter how you try to slice it up, and I don't know if Ilya Brizgolov was ever, I, first off, I think it, 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 obviously it takes a very strong-minded person to make the adjustment in Philadelphia, but when you're coming from a, market like Phoenix where hockey is clearly an afterthought and you know you you may get one or two media members uh, at your practice every day uh, and you're not faced with answering questions repeatedly after a game and you come here it's a complete 180 I mean it, it takes on a whole different role in it and it and I don't I just don't know if he was prepared for everything that went into it he may have thought that he was and I think he may have talked a big game, you know, when he first came here. But you know, it it it, it it's you know, it, it's one of, it's one of those situations where you, you sort of you can't. It's like parent parenting, you know. You you can talk about all you want until you're actually thrusted in that position. You know, you don't you'll never know what it's like. Well, do you see him getting his uh, act together and ended up back in the NHL, or was really his last stop? Uh, it, I think it would take a desperate team. You mentioned Pittsburgh. Uh, if Pittsburgh is really desperate and they really need a backup goaltender uh, and they're willing to deal with the potential baggage that comes with it, then he may get a shot. Now, if I, knowing what I know about him and being, a, you know, if I was a general manager, I would never go down that road because I think there's more detriment that could come out of that than uh, a potential than all the potential positives because even if you are a good team, uh, I think eventually, you know, a guy like Ilya Brizgolov, and we've seen it in the playoffs when he was with Phoenix that he usually folds under, you know, extreme pressure of, of in the playoffs. He did not play well in the playoffs with the Flyers. He did not play well uh, in the playoffs in two years uh, with with Phoenix. So, um, you know, even even if he is, let's say. Um, the stand-up guy and, and, and the perfect, you know, the, the perfect player, and he's uh, he does all the right things. I still don't know whether I, I'd be willing to go down that road. Well, all we can do is have wish Los An or Las Vegas luck on that. But if people well, want I mean, to follow it, you on Twitter, what's that? Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's an East Coast Hockey League team. They're not affiliated with anybody. Uh, if people, you know, I don't know if there's an impression that. Uh, that that he's that one step closer to the NHL. I don't even think it's close right now. Um, like I said, I, I think that a, a team would have to be really, truly desperate and get him on, on the cheap in order to to even you know to take a dive in that pool. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, if people aren't in the Philly area and want to catch you on uh, Twitter or anything like that, what's the best way to reach you, John? Uh, Twitter is at John Bork CSN. So, um, yep, yeah, that's that's the best way. So, um, should be a good and hockey season. Looking forward to it. Yeah, that's for sure. And you got a good partner there with your uh, pre and post game show and Rick Tockett. That's for sure. Another great uh, enforcer, yeah, Rick, as you mentioned earlier. Rick, Rick's uh, Rick's a very good guy. Very easy to talk to. Very well liked uh, amongst everybody here. And actually got three good ones. Uh, him and Al Morgani and. Uh, 
Bill Clement. Work with all three of them a lot, and they're all just they all bring something different to the table, and I learn something from them every time. Well, especially and it, I've seen it when I'm in the Philadelphia area. Both Tockett and Clement, who both played and are well loved in Philadelphia, also articulate the game so well. They do. You're exactly right. They, uh, well, you know, and, and but you know, Bill Clement has gone and he's he's worked at. It. He's he's worked with uh, broadcasting professionals to refine what he does. Takes a great sense of pride in being quote unquote a broadcasting professional. So this was something that he took very seriously once he got out of the game. And you know, Bill's been doing this for a long time. I I, I kid with him. I said. Uh, you just happen to be a broadcasting professional who just happened to have a hockey career. So he's, uh, you know, and then Al, Al is, you know, Al is, uh, does local radio in our area and you probably, he's, for those who don't know him, he was on ESPN during sort of the heyday of ESPN's uh, hockey coverage and he's phenomenal as well because as a radio guy, he'll sit there and talk forever. So, uh, all three guys are, are make it very easy to talk about hockey and all, they all bring a, a different element to the table as well. Obviously, I'm familiar with Al Morgani when I was living in the area. Just besides that he gets ribbed for being from Boston, doesn't make him a bad guy, but he does know his stuff. Yeah, he's been around hockey uh, pretty much his whole life, and although you know he's never played in the NHL, he's certainly very familiar with the Flyers and the history and everything, having covered this team back in the 1980s. And I think that he has certainly earned his you know, he's, he's well respected in the area and somebody that people look at as a hockey authority. Well, obviously, John Bork, he's from CSN Philadelphia. We will be talking to you, to you again in the future. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back, folks. You got it.